Every Jew, and many non-Jews, knows the famous statement, Kol Yisrael yesh laim chelek le'olam haba. Right? All of Israel have a share of the world to come. V'amech kulam tzadikim, right? The average Jew does not know how to decipher what is right and wrong because they have an Erev Rav instead of a Rav. So, the Rambam says, in Yad HaChazakah, in Mishneh Torah, in Chot Shuvah, first halacha, the good that's hidden for the righteous is the life of the world to come. This will be life which is not accompanied by death, and good which is not accompanied by evil. The Torah alludes to this in the promise in, uh, chapter, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 7, so that good will be granted to you and you will live long. The oral Torah explains so that good will be granted to you, this is a world that's entirely good and you will live long, this is a world that's endless. Okay, so here is the beginning where he says this Olam Abba is amazing, it gives you a couple of sources of where it's from and so on. As it continues in this halacha, he says, the retribution, the punishment of the wicked is that they will not merit this life. Rather, they will be cut off and die. Which in Hebrew says, Ikaretu v'yamutu. Whoever does not merit this life is truly dead and will not live forever. Rather, he will be cut off in his wickedness and perish as a beast. This is the intent of the meaning the term, of the term karet in the Torah. For example, one of them is in last week's parashah, chapter uh, 15, Numbers chapter 15, verse 31, where it states, the soul that surely be cut off, ikaret, uh, ikaret nefesh based on the repetition of the same word in the oral tradition, this explains the karet means cut off from this world, and hikaret means uh, cut off from the world to come. After these souls become separated from the bodies in this world, they will not merit the life of the world to come. Rather, even in the world to come, they will be cut off. So now, here he's telling you what, in essence, someone that's righteous has, Olam Abba, which is great, wonderful, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot, obviously a lot more details. Uh, even more so in Allah, the second halacha, but the point is, it says that there's righteousness, wicked. This is the 13 principles of faith. Righteous get merit and get Allah Abba, wicked lose Allah Abba. So now, this first halacha was originally the reason Hazal explains that many of the sages that didn't read the entire Mishneh Torah that haven't gotten to his um, Sanhedrin part of his Mishneh Torah, this is the reason why they wanted to burn these books. This is the reason why they went, many of the sages went against the Rambam. They said that the way that he described Olam Abba, reward and punishment, was completely insufficient. Even the Goyim know it's Sabbath. So they know what Shabbat is. Maybe they don't know the consequences of violating Shabbat. They don't know the consequences of going against Hashem and so on and so forth. But they know that Shabbat exists, which makes it different than all of the other days. They know just enough where when he said that the retribution 
is just losing Olam Abba and that's it. It's what it seems like on the first Allah It's still, when you go to the fifth Allah it gives more details. But in the first Allah it seems like it's either you get Olam Abba or you don't get anything. They said it was so far away from really what happens that they wanted to mamash cancel out this entire series. Why? It says because you didn't talk about Gehenom. He says someone losing their Olam Abad seems like a fairy tale. Like, okay, so you didn't go to play with the kids. Big deal. You didn't get the ice cream. You didn't get the reward. You didn't get the trophy award. You didn't get the uh, uh, participation award. No, they said, no, no, no. The, uh, in, in the introduction of chapter 10 of the Sanhedrin, the Rambam states what karet really means. And he says that the most severe punishment that the soul receives is karet, but this is not intended to imply that there's no other rep- retribution. On the contrary, on the contrary, here there's the details of what happens to those that sin, what happens to those that don't get Olam Abba, and Hashem Echem, they get serious Gehenom. They're not having Olam Abba is the least of their worries. The suffering that they get instead of Olam Abba is what, is what people thought he wasn't teaching. So in the fifth Alakha, he actually says the retribution beyond which there's no, great, greater, there's, there's no greater punishment than this, is when a soul is cut off and will not merit the world to come. This is referring to the obliteration of the soul. Which is uh, uses the uh, verse in uh, in Psalm fifty five twenty four, which is a um, the pit of destruction is referring to uh, to Be'er uh, Shachat. So and then he gives the different the seven different names for this uh, nullification of the soul, but all of it is referring to these seven different names, which the Gemara talks about. These are the seven different names of Gehenom. Now. I'm not going to obviously go give you guys a shield by Gehenom right now, but to give you an idea, an idea of what we're dealing with here. So no one says that they don't know. In the book Rishit Chochma, Shara Ira, it says, V'arasha she'achrish, she'achrish, he says anyone that teaches teaches Torah but he tries to darken the issue of gain no meaning as if it doesn't exist unfortunately this sounds very similar to today's teaching which is no no gain is like a washing machine the washing machine, you go there for a year, you get washed a little bit, like a thorough car cleaning, and everything's okay. So first and foremost, Chazal explains, this is giving uh, many, many sources, but here he's talking about here, this person that actually is using euphemisms to minimize what the genome really is, what the punishment for sin is, he's considered 100% a rasha. Consider Rasha, why? Because he's leading people to have false beliefs. And how do we know that there is such a thing as Gainom? In the Gemara Masechet Eruvin, page 19a, uh, uh, a, it says, Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Shiva Shemot yesh lo legeinom ve'elu em, Sheol ve'avadon be'er shachat bo'or sha'on, Tit ayaven ve'tzalmavet ve'eretz tachtit. It says there are seven, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, who actually saw Gainom. There's a whole uh, Gemara about it, of how he met um, Eliyahu and Avi, and Eliyahu and Avi showed him Gehenom. And uh, he says that there are actually seven names for Gehenom in the Torah. There are seven names for it. And he gives the verses in, uh, from the prophet jo- Jonah, from Tehillim, from Psalms, from a, um, uh, the prophet Yeshaya, which is Isaiah, 
uh, several several verses and also in the five books of Moses, uh, for example, one of them being the Parashat Korach. So we have several seven different names for Gehenom. One of them is Sheol, which we learn in Parashat Korach. That's when the ground opened up. And it says that uh, Korach and his family, except his kids, uh, fell into Sheol. It's called, one time it's called Sheol, another time it's called Sheola. So here, the Gemara says that is another name for Gehenom. In another place in the Gemara, it says that there's three openings for Gehenom. One of them is in a, um, the desert, where Korach is. One of them is in Yerushalayim, and one of them is in the sea. One of them is somewhere in the ocean. So first name is Sheol, that's where Korach is. And a Rasha that minimizes the issues of Gehenom says that Gehenom doesn't exist, or it's a Christian belief, or it's not part of Judaism, or it's not really such a big deal. It's a washing machine that just goes away after a year. He is considered 100% a Rasha according to the Torah, and the reason why is because he's given people false belief. So that's one. Second thing is, it's called Avadon. Avadon we learn from a different, from Tehilim. Another one is Be'er Shachat, another one is Bo Sha'on, another one is Tita Yaven, Tzalmavit, Tzalmavit is also in uh, Tehilim, and then another one is Eretz HaTachtit, which is actually in um, Vaikra. So here we have the whole issue of Gehenom being very much a very real thing. So now the next question is, what is this that everybody keeps saying about how there's only a uh, year in Gehenom, it's just a washing machine. Where do they get that from? In the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 17, it talks about how there's a Gehenom and that the trial is one year. The trial is one year. There's no such thing as Gehenom is one year. Gehenom could be eternity. But according to Rashid Chokhmah, which uses uh, at least no less than five different sources, he says that the minimum sentence in Gehenom is 20 years. The minimum sentence in Gehenom is 20 years. Nowhere here, not that I uh, remember this by heart, this whole book, but here in Perik Shlishi, in uh, Shara Ira, it talks about Rabbi Meir, Mishum Rabbi Lazar. Says, Kashe Yom Adin Shakados Baruch Hu Dan Et Adam Bekever Yotem Din Shel Gehenom Din Gehenom Me Esrim Shana Ule Mala. Says that uh, the uh, judgment of Gehenom is twenty years or more. The mitzvah of loving your fellow, you have to do this, you have to do that, and in the end he writes, but this fellow that we're talking about, you're supposed to love, is only someone that's a fellow in mitzvot. And not a rasha that's forsaking the Torah regularly. Because that type of person, it's a mitzvah to hate him. That's the section that the Zionists that were forsaking the Torah on a regular basis deleted. Along with a few other sections that were very similar. That were talking specifically against heretics and apikosim. A person that does not have the right ideology will have a very difficult time swallowing what I just said. In fact, they will reject it viciously. Because what do you mean? On one hand, I've gone eight and a half a month. On the other hand, you tell me, uh, Kafakela is where I'm going. On the other hand, I'm going to Holocaust. Well, well, what's the matter with you? Why can't I have like a middle ground? Like once in a while. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't have once in a while. And that's why he says in Parashat Shmini, Vayomer Moshe, Moshe says to the nation, This is the thing that Hashem has commanded you to do. Then the glory of Hashem will appear to you. Trust me when I tell you it's sad. If you knew 5% of what I know about what happens after this life, you would cry for these people. Not because... You have mercy for them now. You're not allowed to have mercy for them now. You have mercy for them, what's going to happen to them when they can't help themselves, when they leave this world. And now Kadosh Baruch is going to punish them to no end. To no end. The Holocaust becomes like a kindergarten game next to what's going to happen to these people if they don't do tshuva. Trust me when I tell you, when I think about this stuff, I cry. Because nothing can help them once they leave this world. Nothing, nothing, no Kaddish, nothing, nothing can help them, nothing. They can build five yeshivot in their name, it won't help them. Nothing can help them. If they leave this world this way, nothing can help them. 
and you have no idea what's going to happen to these people and their supporters the people that donated money and resources to Ephraim or to Manis or to Meza or any of these Rishayim you have no idea what a Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to do to them if they leave this world this way you have no idea people have no concept of what happens after this life no concept of, of anything people are clueless they think we live in, in, in some IOU where our Kadosh Baruch Hu owes us stuff people have no idea I nothing no clue whatsoever what happens after this world and trust me when I tell you you will not want even if you end up going to Gan Eden you will not want to know that there's people in Gainon once you know what's in it you have no idea what happens in those places no idea there is no reason in the world for anyone to to be happy that someone is a wicked person we have to know that these people are also Akadosh Baruch's kids and we want them to do tshuva. But we cannot, under any condition, accept their current behavior as acceptable. We have to protest for the sake of Akadosh Baruch's name and Anna. We have to speak against them. We have to do everything possible that's allowed according to Allah to discredit them in every single way. You're even allowed to say Lashon Ara about people like this. You're even allowed to make up stuff if you want. If it's going to help people stay away from them. But doesn't mean that we want them to die this way. These are Akadosh Baruch Hu's babies. But at the same token, Akadosh Baruch Hu has laws for himself. That although they are his children, once they forsaken him, once they went against him, he's obligated to punish them. Just like a mother that has kids that she put her whole life on a line to raise them. And those kids one day just decide, we don't want to play with you. We don't want to listen to you. We don't want to love you. And that mother, her heart is broken into 50 million pieces. But at the same token, she knows that if she allows them to continue behaving this way, those kids will become little Hitlers. Those kids will become a disaster and not only a pain for her, but a pain for society. And therefore, she is forced to punish those kids in order to have them behave better. Does she enjoy punishing them? No, she hates it. She suffers more than them, but she has to do it. The same thing happens with Akadosh Baruchu, Le'avdil, Melech Elef Avdalot. He has to punish his kids why for the sake of the Torah itself and for the sake of his of his righteous people and if that means he has to punish his kids that went against them that caused other people to go against them in the highest level of punishment to the point of complete annihilation after the ultimate suffering to destroy their neshama things that you have no concept what they mean Kadosh who still does it and has to do it in order to maintain the honor of his Torah, his name, and of course his other children that sacrificed their lives to upkeep both.